Mark, I'll go to Mark. Okay, in this paper, hmm. it's about the conditions necessary for liberal democracy. Uh, and in particular, in this paper, I look at uh, the changing concept of power which influenced uh, this. Gellner himself was not particularly taken by the terms liberal democracy and preferred civil society. Part of the reason for that was uh, his critique of liberalism, and essential to that is his critique of uh, the social contract tradition. Another aspect, um, which, and we will come to this, another aspect of um, uh, uh, Gellner's um, hesitance about using the term liberal democracy was he felt that democracy held out a false promise. He held out the idea that people could, could govern society as a whole, and in fact he disagreed with this. Um, I agree with some of Gellner in this and disagree with other aspects of Gellner. Um, and I'll come to this later in the paper. In particular, what I want to look at uh, is the concept of power associated with the transition to liberal democracy. Um, the paper is divided into two parts. In the first part, I analyze uh, Gellner's account of the conditions of civil society. And in the second part, I add uh, my critique and my analysis. Um, the second part is the more original part, so therefore I'll emphasize that. But by way of introduction, I'll say something about uh, Gellner's own analysis. In agrarian societies, the central element about agrarian societies is essentially that surplus or profit was never invested in capital. Essential to that is the idea that in an agrarian society, if you produce surplus, uh, what will happen to you is that it will be coerced from you. Now, this creates an incentive to move profit into the means of coercion, into the means of coercion in order to defend yourself, essentially. Um, now, if you didn't do that and you produce more profit, then somebody else is bound to coerce you. So either you produce, either you buy coercion or other people buy coercion. How do you get out of this? Well, essential to Gellner's account is the idea of the Protestant, is uh, uh, an elaboration of Weber's account of the Protestant ethic in the spirit of capitalism. Um, what is essential to capitalism, of course, is the irrational behavior whereby somebody produces profit, doesn't use it for pleasure, uh, but rather reinvests it in capital. And in the, what happens with otherworldly Protestantism is, of course, that people become insecure. They, they're faced with the idea of, you know, are they predestined? Are they, are they chosen by God? So they become fundamentally ontologically insecure. This insecurity creates a compulsion to work uh, and, a, and a fear of pleasure. Because pleasure, of course, is the moment in which you're led into temptation by the devil. So therefore, what you do is you avoid pleasure at all costs. So the hard-working Protestant c creates profit, of course, by working hard. Uh, but then with that profit, he doesn't or she doesn't buy pleasure. Rather, he has to do something with it, so they reinvest it. Now, Gellner adapts this by arguing that this same God-fearing Protestant, in fact, would be somebody who would be incapable of um, buying coercion. Because, you see, they don't value the profit. They don't value these goods. So instead, they're not, so they're not going to buy the means of coercion to protect them. So not only do they reinvest, but they avoid buying coercion. Now, there's a second element to Gellner's hypothesis, which is the fact that ultimately the, a second revolution took place, and this is a technological revolution, whereby it was possible to essentially set up what he terms a bribery fund, whereby um, the, there was a sufficient profit to pay off the predators in a regular basis, in other words, taxation. So essentially what you have is you have the predators now become specialists in taxation and you have the state emerging as a monopoly in taxation, taxing the economy and taxing it in a regular way. Now this is functional to capitalism because capitalism, of course, is premised upon the idea of bookkeeping. And essentially you can predict how much taxes you're going to pay every, every year, whereas you can't predict predation as such as in the agricultural system, agrarian society. 
So what happens with the emergence of, of, of this type of the separation of coercion from production is that you have a society in which for the first time in history those who produce can separate themselves from the task of coercion and you have specialists in coercion and specialists in production. Now, this is the first time in history this in fact happens according to Gellner. This is essential to Gellner's argument that for the first time in history the economy essentially dominates the polity. The production essentially dominates coercion. And this is central to uh, the separation of the economy and the policy, the separation out of the policy and the, the, the policy from civil society. And this, of course, is the premise of modern liberal democracy. Okay, I, I will now move on to my own account and, and, uh, of an addition to uh, Gellner's analysis. It's not a falsification, but more an addition to it. I would agree with uh, Gellner in the sense, in, in, in the sense that, that, that I think there was a fundamental ontological transformation which changed power structure. Where I disagree with him is I don't think it was simply, in Gellner's account, it's simply a case of containing coercive power. What I would argue is that, in fact, what happened with the emergence of modernity and of modern democracy was that there emerged a new type of power, a new type of power too, a new type of capacity for action, a new type of political power, which is not primarily based upon coercion, but is based upon what I would call structural constraint. Okay? And that is this structure, what I would call structural power, uh, which is essential to the transition to liberal democracy. In the literature of power, there are basically two schools of thought, and you can, you can represent them as on a scale. Now, the conflictual theorists, people, uh, and these would include Max Weber, uh, um, Robert Dahl, Bach Eichenberg, Stephen Lukes, and then there are the consensual theorists. These would be uh, primarily Barry Barnes, uh, Talcott Parsons, and Hannah Arendt. And then there are theorists in between, who include myself, Anthony Giddens, Stuart Clegg, and to some extent Michael Mann, though he's, he would be on the conflictual side. Now, the conflictual theorists emphasize power over, and by and large, they reduce power over to coercion, just like Gellner does. Uh, the consensual theorists, on the other hand, emphasize power as a capacity for action. The central element in their theory is the idea that membership of a social order gives you a capacity for action which you wouldn't otherwise have, and that capacity for action is greater than simply coercive power. Coercive power is something that you have in the state of nature. Right? Where, whereas social power is something that you have as membership of a society which is over and above coercive power. Um, in the work of, of, of Parsons, of course, this, this consensual power, this, this power too, is derived from uh, shared social norms. In the work of Barry Barnes, it's derived, in a kind of, it's derived from a kind of Kuhnian theory of, 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 of um, cognitive shared cognitive order, and I, I would be building on that to some extent. Um, in Hannah Arendt, it's derived from the civic republican tradition and a shared consensus in that. What is central to uh, power to is the fact that society gives you a capacity for action, a capacity for action which is over and above what you would have in the state of nature. Now, in the essay, this, and this is power to, this social power is different from natural power. In the state of nature, in nature, you gain natural power by knowledge of predictability. For instance, as argued by somebody like Barry Barnes, for instance, our knowledge that steam expands uh, and uh, when uh, water, when heat it turns into steam and this expands, gives us the power to create a steam engine. This gives us a greater capacity for action. Similarly, our knowledge of the predictability of others gives us an added capacity for action. Now, what I would argue that this, this knowledge and the predictability of others, which is actually the central element of social order, is what gives us social power. And this social power exists over and above coercive power. And unlike uh, 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 Barnes and Parsons, I would argue that this also not only gives us power to, but gives us power over others. And I'll explain that in a moment. What I want, first want to do now is I want to talk a little bit about social order. What is social order? 
Social order is essentially the predictability in others. Now, what makes somebody predictable is the fact that their action is meaningful. Right? The fact that they attach the same meaning to their action as other people do interacting with them. So they understand what it is that they're doing. Now, meaning is essentially structure. And structure and meaning are the same thing. Take the word cat, for instance, and the furry creature that runs along the ground. Now, the furry creature and the word cat, are, the word and the furry creature are both carriers of structure. And the fact that we perceive of them in that way is what makes an action structured. Now, in social interaction, if what is essential is that we perceive the same meaning in interaction. Take, for instance, Garfinkel's preaching experiments. Remember, in Garfinkel's preaching experiments, Garfinkel instructed his students, when they were confronted with somebody who says, hello, how are you? They were meant to interpret that as a literal request, and they were meant to say, how am I in what respect? With respect to my mother, with respect to my ch children, with respect to my financial well-being. And people got annoyed, right? Because, of course, hello, how are you? There's only one inter correct interpretation of hello, how are you? Fine, thanks. In other words, it's not a request on how, how you are. All that interaction presupposes, in fact, that social actors are structurally constrained in this way. The socially deviant actor who upsets other actors is somebody who doesn't observe these types of structural constraints. Structural constraint is essential to social interaction. And what I would argue, Giddens argues that structure presupposes structuration. What I would argue is that it not only presupposes structuration, but it presupposes confirming structuration. An actor structures, and another actor confirms structures that specific meaning. Now, the problem about structuration and confirming structuration is, of course, that these structures are essentially arbitrary. Right? They are not cast in stone. They're not printed into our genes. Okay, Chomsky argues that they might be to some extent, so does Kant. We all seem to have a concept of time, but let's take the concept of time as an instance. Okay? Let's say, take the Aborigine, who has a concept of time, which is walkabout time, okay? and then the Western person, who has a concept of time, which is clock time. Now, these are fundamentally different acts of structuration, and when somebody, uh, when a, a, a person, a person or an Aborigine interacting with a modern person holding walkabout time, they cannot structure and confirm structure to each other. The, the interaction between them is impossible. And this is because they presuppose different, essentially arbitrary, acts of structuration and confirmed structuration. So how is it that structuration and structures are routinely reproduced? They're routinely reproduced because social actors don't perceive of them as arbitrary. They, by and large, don't see them as cultural constructs. In fact, it's only in late modernity that this is taking place. In a traditional, very traditional society, as argued by Gellner, actors were multi-stranded, and they saw, they couldn't see the separation between the natural world and the social world. Right? So therefore, the norms of, the, the predictability of the natural world was extended to the social world. Anybody who violated the order of the social world was violating the order of the natural world. So if you all of a sudden chose not to see the sun as a white cockatoo and the moon as a black cockatoo, you were violating nature and you were violating and you were also violating the norms of your tribe. And this is Gellner's point about multi-standard thought. Okay? We s see a separation between, uh, between social norms and society. They didn't. In the feudal system, uh, in, in the feudal system, a central element was teleology. And teleology, of course, is the belief that things have essences. Okay? In the Aristotelian system, for instance, the acorn becomes an oak because it has the essence of oakness within it. So it, 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 this essence is what makes it become an oak. Translated into feudalism, uh, what you have is you have the idea that ultimately every member of society has an essence within them. And incorporated within this is also the idea of the great chain of being. You have a hierarchy extending from God down to the humblest plant. And everything within this hierarchy is realizing its specific essence. And if you violate that, 
you're violating the natural order of things, you're violating God's law, and you're violating meaning itself, actually. Uh, let us take, for instance, the idea of being a feudal lord. The being a feudal lord means, okay, you get tribute, but you also protect people. You protect yourself, you protect the peasants. Now, let us say that the feudal lord for instance, decides not to protect his peasants. The peasants go along and they're, they're being robbed or they're, and the feudal lord doesn't validate his obligation. So maybe the feudal lord, even worse, he joins up with the robbers and decides to rob the peasants. Now what happens in a case like that? What happens in a case like that is that to the eyes of the peasant, the feudal lord either is not a feudal lord anymore, right? in which case he no longer owes obligation to him. So the structural constraint ceases. Right. Or alternatively, the peasant sees the feudal system as inherently arbitrary, as something which is no longer divinely ordained, in which case the feudal system is in trouble. Right. So what is what? And this is where I would argue that ultimately social power presupposes a kind of semantic contract whereby social actors behave in a certain way consistent with what care is a meaning they are. You see, it's not only words that carry meaning, but it's people. Take, for instance, my job as a university lecturer. If I, there are certain ways in which I, I my, the power that I have over students, for instance, is premised upon what it is to be a university lecturer. Okay? So I can tell my students, for instance, that they should hand in their, they should write an essay about social contracts. But I can't demand of them that, this, that they read the Koran and start praying every morning at five. Okay? Because that is inconsistent with what it means to be a university lecturer. And both the student and I are structurally constrained by those meanings. Now, if I start violating those meanings, right, which, then I actually undermine the actual power that I have. And this is where, where there's actually a disjuncture between structural constraint and coercive power. The use of coercive power in a way that violates the semantics of a structured system actually undermines that system and makes it weaker. So this is why coercion and social power actually exist in an inverse relationship to each other. I mean, this is absolutely fundamental. If you take, for instance, a parent and a child, what makes a parent powerful is not the fact that they can coerce the child and hit the child, but that they can control the child. And if, a ch if the, the parent behaves in a way which is inconsistent with the role of parent, with father or mother and so on and so forth, they're actually undermining their power, not strengthening it. Okay. What happens in a transition from the, tra from the traditional to the modern was that the teleological worldview became perceived of as arbitrary. Okay. And what was essential, and a number of things happened. In fact, there was a, what I would call an ontological transformation, whereby our interpretive horizon changed within modernity. And the social structures and meanings which sustained the feudal system became perceived of as essentially arbitrary. What were the elements that were essential to this transformation? Well, the, the two I'll talk about. Um, one, which is the teleological one, which we also already talked about, and the other, which is the one to do with social contract. And I want to talk about that because Gellner is so critical of the social contract tradition. Okay, in the transition, one of the elements which undermined teleology was actually the advance of science. When Galileo saw the moons of Jupiter for the first time as moons, and don't forget, this is again what I'm talking about, structuration. He actually saw them in a different way. They're carriers of different types of meaning. And what actually happens then is that the laws of the physics of the earth become extended to the heavens. So in other words, it's not part of the essence of Jupiter to behave in a particular way. Rather, it is part of, part of a specific physics. Now translate, it, translate that for a moment into, the, into, the, into social life. In, what it essentially means is that every social actor is a monad who's interchangeable with another social actor. Okay? They are functionally equivalent. Okay? There are no essences left. Now, it's important to remember, following somebody like Norbert Elias, I mean, what is essential to the feudal system was the belief in these differences in essence. And people actually 
live very different lifestyles. There's a Danish saying which sum, sums this up, uh, an aristocratic saying, which is uh, one speaks Latin to one being an aristocrat, of course, one speaks Latin to scholars, um, French to aristocrats, German to the peasants, and Danish to the dogs. It was a culturally differentiated society in which, and, and then following Elias too, you have this idea that they are different lifestyles. Okay, they spoke French, they lived differently, they were different people, they are different essences. Okay? Now all of a sudden, everybody is functionally the same. They are, they are atoms which bounce off each other. So all of a sudden, the world of essences falls apart. It becomes perceived of ab as arbitrary nonsense. And this is the point that Foucault also makes in his analysis, for instance, in the, in the change from, from, from a classical and, and sovereign mode of punishment to, to a modern one in discipline and punish. The point was it, that this transition, the feudal system of punishment was, a, was not an arbitrary one. It became perceived of as an arbitrary one because of a specific transition. Okay, what about the social contract tradition? Gellner makes fun of the Rawlsian, of Rawlsians, and he makes fun particularly of the idea of the social contract, the idea of, uh, you know, it's, it's a kind of, the idea of the Descartes wanting to separate himself from society, become kind of like a Robinson Crusoe-like person. This is the idea of the person in the social contract. They know nothing about themselves, as described by Rawls. They know nothing about themselves, they know nothing about their social conditions. They just know something generally about society and what it is to be a human. Now, the best way of thinking about this is in terms of actually Gellner's own account of single standard and multi standard thought. Single standard, the, in the in traditional and newer society, you talk about bull cucumbers. Right? A bull cucumber is something which is both a bull and a cucumber. And this appears like nonsense to us. So uh, in Emil Durkheim, the, the, the sun is both a white cockatoo and, and, and the sun. Now, what is happening? in modern modernity is that different forms of thought become separated out and they become separate from each other. In other words, fact and value become different from each other. The social norms and the descriptions become different. And I would argue that actually Gellner's insistence on viewing social contract as an actual descriptive account is about as absurd as uh, taking the bull cucumber account literally. What is happening with the social contract is, in fact, it's a form of methodological bracketing whereby we separate out one aspect of things from others. What we're doing is we're separating out the position of the social <coughs> agent thinking <coughs> about justice from their specific social conditions. Uh, viewing social contract as a description of society is fundamentally flawed. It's to do with thinking about justice. Now, in Gellner, we have an account of somebody who wakes up in the morning and, and finds himself born as a beetle. And again, he finds this very disturbing because you, you're sort of a man beetle. And you know, how can you be a beetle and a man? Well, let me take, let us take Max Weber and his four types of action. You have effective action, you have instrumental action, you have value rationality, and so on. Now, those are actually four types of single-stranded thought which are separated out. Okay. A person, you have a person, uh, an old lady runs in front of a car. Somebody goes to save her. Now, why are they saving her? It could be because they love the old lady. It's my granny. That's effective action. It could be value rationality. It could be because they think, you know, that, that one should revere old people. Or it could be instrumental action. It could be, you know, the traffic must flow efficiently. Okay? Or it could be traditional action. That is to say, one always does this kind of thing. Now what you have is you have four types of single standard thought. Now single, being able to think single standard in this way is essential to perceptions of justice. And what all that Rawls is trying to do is to single out these aspects of single standard thought. Now these aspects of single standard thought, you find them in everyday life. Imagine, for instance, in a conversation and somebody says to you, you're talking about justice and you're talking about a just way of doing things and somebody says to you, well, you would say that as that type of person, you know. Now, what they're actually saying is that you are being influenced by the particulars of your social circumstances. If you want to convince them that what you're saying is really just, what you have to do is you have to, you have to show them 
that the principles of justice which you are enunciating have nothing to do with the particularities of your specific circumstances. Okay? And that is again a form of single standard thought, and it's this type of single standard thought which uh, Rawls and also somebody like Habermas are trying to distill out, which are central to liberalism. I said in the paper that, um, that these, these elements, uh, these, the elements that contribute to liberal democracy, I'm just taking two. In the paper, I take more. Teleology and single standard thinking can also contribute to the undermining of democracy. And I now want to talk a little bit about that because uh, in order to provide balance. Okay, teleology. We are essentially non-teleological agents. And as McIntyre has argued, this non-teleological aspect of our action makes us ideal consumers. Right? We are ideal people who go around the place uh, and incidentally, thinking in terms of consumer is actually being a, a form of single standard logic. Okay. Um, we go around the place you know, the idea is, is, is the ideal consumer is somebody like Don Giovanni, uh, Don Juan. Somebody who loves, Don Juan loves seducing women, but once he seduces them, he's no longer interested in them. The ideal consumer is the same. They go out and purchase something, but the moment they purchase it, the object is useless. They have to buy something else. Now, that type of person is not particularly conducive to a society in which you can reflect upon social, democratic social norms. That type of person is an essentially unreflexive Asian who goes from, who essentially is totally taken over by consumptive desire, is totally absorbed by the economy. Now, of course, central to liberal democracy is precisely the division between the economy and the demos. This, and, and norms. This type of person is continually just driven by the economy. So therefore, they don't have political reflexivity. Uh, I argued that um, single standard thought is essential to uh, modernity, uh, and in particular the contract tradition. But single standardness, okay, when you think about single standardness, you don't think about the particularities of somebody. So let's say you're, you're thinking about, you're, you, you, you know a specific individual, you know her as Mary, who lives up the road, whose mother I know, and so on and so forth. You want to think about justice. You don't think about that, you think about the case. You think about, you know, n number 4,455. And number 4,455 requires these and these things. It's the same thing that university lecturers, if they want to be just in marking exams, they don't think about individual students and how they like them and dislike them. They think about an exam. Now, this is essential to justice. But it can also, as argued by Bauman, be used to transport people to the gas chambers. As Goebbels said, and, and Bauman quotes Goebbels somewhat, saying that, you know, essential to the final solution is the fact that the average German does not think about the Jew around the corner who they know, but they think about the abstract Jew. Okay? They think about the Jew as 4,455. They don't think about them as Miriam up the road who I happen to like. Okay? So in that sense, the ability to think single-standardly, if you think too single-standardly, is actually essential to the ability to carry out the Holocaust. What I would argue is that essential to a democratic system is actually the ability to be able to think single-standardly, to move from single-standard thought to multi-standard thought, so that you think about May as 4,555 some of the time, but not all of the time. Okay, I'll leave it at that.